um, a few words then um, just to just to kick things off. Um, so good evening. Thanks to everyone for uh, for signing up and, and obviously a massive thank you to, uh, to Jeremy and Imogen for this evening. Um, just as a bit of background for those of you that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. Um, I'm the founder of the London Java community and also run RecWorks. Uh, it's a tech recruitment company based in London. Um, so here at RecWorks, we've been on a mission for the last 12 years to prove that recruitment can be a, a force for good in the tech industry uh, beyond just getting people jobs. Um, and this all, all came about when I realized that we spent all day, every day, speaking to developers and employers in the same industry. Uh, so developers, grads, CTOs, people relocating in, um, all sorts. Um, and I started wondering if we could use our position at the heart of that uh, industry as connectors in, in other ways. Um, so now what we try to do is bring people together around things like learning, career development, mentoring, that kind of thing. Uh, basically, I'm a bit of a career geek. Uh, so I like to find the various places that you can, you can take your career, uh, especially in tech, and then find the, the hacks and the shortcuts that people use to, to, um, to get there uh, and hand those down. Um, so most recently, we've been playing with this concept of, um, of bringing people together in small learning groups. Uh, one of those groups is called Aspiring Speakers, uh, and it aims to encourage a new diverse generation of speakers, especially in London, but, but really all over the world. Um, and this event is part of that. Um, so the two speakers that we've got this evening gave their first LJC events recent, uh, recently and are back for more. Um, so a few words on feedback. Really appreciate if you wouldn't mind sharing any feedback, um, uh, words of encouragement, things that you enjoy and, and that kind of thing, particularly in, in the topics. It's all very, very useful when, um, when getting started. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker of this evening, which is Jeremy Chan. Uh, Jeremy is currently a VP at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he's pre previously worked at Credit Suisse uh, and Barclays and has got a master's in computer science and engineering. Uh, Jeremy's going to be speaking to you on uh, get to know the Unicode monster and don't let it harm you. Jeremy, over to you. Thanks, Barry, for the intro. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, Barry, can you give me a thumbs up when you see it? Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeremy Chen. Um, I work in Goldman Sachs as a full stack developer. Today, I'm going to talk about Unicode. This is personally a very interesting topic to me because I can see a lot of developers in the, in the UK or in the US or any other English speaking countries. They do not know or understand Unicode well enough, but then they will, they will be able to get by for a very long time as long as they don't deploy their application to an international audience. But when they do, that's when the Unicode monster actually comes and harm you. So the objective of today's talk is to give you enough background on Unicode such that the next time when you encounter something like this or an error like this, even you can't see what's there, but you know exactly why it is happening and you won't be like doing this. So I would like to start by giving a very brief history of Unicode. I think it's the most useful way to understand Unicode is to look at the history because that's the only way you can appreciate how the designers and creators actually thought at the time to design this encoding scheme in such a way as in today's state. And let's look at a very basic concept first. What is an encoding trying to achieve? Is to basically turn characters into bytes and vice versa. For example, this is what you see in your computer browser, HI, two characters. And under the hood, the computer will try to encode it into a, a number of bytes. And these number of bytes will be the state to store it into the storage media or be transmitted over the wire on the internet. And this is where the whole encoding scheme is coming into the picture. And in this case, I'm encoding like the two characters into two bytes. And let's go back in time, back to the 60s. The computer scientists in USA were facing the same problem as we do, that they, they need to encode some English alphabet into bytes. And at that time, what they proposed was the ASCII scheme, 
which is a fixed size encoding scheme with 7 bits per character. And 7 bit will give you 128 possible characters. And if you look at the table in this page, this must look very familiar to you because this is the table where your teacher will, will show you, your programming textbook will show you, and the teacher will simply tell you that, okay, A is 65, Z is 122, and this is how the computer uh, represents a string. And while this works reasonably well in the US, it didn't work quite well in the European countries. As you can imagine, like 128 characters isn't enough to store like the British pound symbol, the, the accents in, in Europe. And at that time, the solution to tackle this was people think that, okay, we want to map each character to one byte. And one byte has eight bits. We are only using seven bits at the time. Why don't we just use the remaining bits and that will allow us to encode up to 256 characters and we can also store characters with the accents for our, our European languages. And while this works for one country, it doesn't work for all the European countries. And that's when the dark age of encoding happens, where each country try to uh, establish their own encoding standards just to make it work for their own languages. And you can imagine that become very hectic and what if you get a file from someone, you have to know in advance what encoding that file is encoded in before you can read the file. And if you were on the internet old for old enough, then you, and if you are not a native English speaker, then you may have an experience like this. You go to a web page, you see some gibberish on the page, and people will ask you to, okay, go to en character encoding in your browser and just try to switch things around and just hope that it worked, but this was the old days. So now if we fast forward to 1990s, there were a group of people that proposed Unicode. They say, okay, let's end all this nonsense. Why don't we just have a character set that will be possible to store all the possible characters on earth in every possible languages. And this proposal was pretty aggressive. What they, proposed was to introduce a layer of abstraction between the byte and the character and such that we translate each character to a unique number which we call the code point and then from code point to byte we can do it in a variable encoding scheme such that one code point can map to multiple bytes and that will solve all our issues about not having enough uh, code points for encoding different languages. And you may ask, then in this case, how many code points is enough? In the current Unicode standard, we use 21 bit to store all the valid code points. And that translates to about a million possibilities. And you may think a million doesn't sound a lot if we are talking about storing all the possible languages on earth. But if you ask me, I think it is definitely good enough because if we look at the current utilization, we are using about 13% of the code points. And we have basically already exhausted all the written languages from present to past. And even we have rooms to add new languages like emojis. And you can see out of those 140,000 around, about half of them is actually Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, which uh, having a lot more characters, but right now we are only using 13% and we have already mapped everything we want to map. So I can see that 1 million is probably good enough for the foreseeable future. And even if you look at the latest Unicode standard, Unicode 13, we are not doing much except by adding more and more emojis because that's what people like nowadays. And let's now look at, just quickly look at some examples of Unicode. This is the basic English alphabet A. You can see that it corresponds to code point uh, hexadecimal 41, which is still 65 in decimal. So that's what you can see like for Unicode, the first 128 characters, 
they are trying to follow the exact same mapping with ASCII to make it backward compatible. But for other characters like this one, letter A with a tilde, some Arabic letter, uh, Chinese characters, etc. These are all brand new code points. But each character is mapped to a unique code point. And of course, like uh, people love emojis. So in Unicode, we have a lot of these as well. And you may ask like who decide what character map to which number and can I add my own? And the answer is yes. Um, the Unicode Consortium, which is a group formed by multiple companies like Apple, Samsung, Oracle, etc., they they are accept proposal from the general public. Actually, a couple of years ago, someone from Hacker News say that uh, why is the power symbol not found in the Unicode standard? And then another member actually jumped out and say, okay, do you want to work on a proposal to add it into the, to, to, to the Unicode standard? And they actually went ahead with it. And it's pretty tedious process. So if you, on one day, you, if you want to add your own Unicode character, then definitely check out their blog post because they did provide a lot of useful information on how you can like get your proposal accepted. And now we have addressed half of the problem. We are able to map the characters into a number code point. But the remaining problem is how we are able to map the code points into a variable number of bytes. And unfortunately, people can't get to an agreement on this. That's where multiple encoding standards like UTF-8, UTF-16, and UTF-32 come into the picture. And the number after UTF denotes the code unit. Say for example, UTF-8 will map each code point into unit of eight bits, and UTF-16 will try to map it into a unit of 16 bits. So I'm not going to go into details of how the encoding scheme map the code point into bits, but two things to take away is that UTF-8 is the most popular encoding scheme on the internet. Uh, over 95% of the web pages are in UTF-8. The main reason being UTF-8 is backward compatible with ASCII. If you look at the letter A here, letter A is mapped to hexadecimal 41, which is exactly the same as you were encoding it in ASCII. So if you throw an ASCII document into a program that is expecting UTF-8, it will just work. So that's why UTF-8 is so popular because everything legacy, all the legacy document that were, that were produced in ASCII format will continue to work for programs supporting UTF-8 as the encoding scheme. However, Java and many programming languages, they use UTF-16 under the hood, and that will actually lead to some of the pitfalls that I'm going to highlight now. So now you all understand how Unicode works, it's time to look at the scary stuff. A very scary part of Unicode is that it is actually possible to combine multiple code points together. For example, the letter E can be combined with an acute accent to become the French letter E with an acute. And you can see on the left side, we, can, we are combining two code points. And on the right side, it's one code point. And while this looks exactly the same on the screen, under the hood is different. And you can see in this case, if you call objects.equals on these two strings, it's returning false because one of them is a combination of two code points and one of them is only one code point. So to be able to resolve such problems, you need to apply normalization. And Java provides a different, a various forms of normalizer. You can either fully expand it into multiple code points or you can try to compress it as much as possible. But the key is that you have to apply normalization in the same way for both sides, similar to how you do like case insensitive search. You either convert everything to lowercase or you convert everything to uppercase. But normalization is the key here because you can imagine if you're trying to build like an authentication system and you're trying to compare usernames and you definitely don't want uh, scenarios like this to happen. And by the way, Unicode can also apply multiple code points to form emoji. In this case, 
you can combine a man emoji with a skin tone modifier to become another emoji. But in this case, that other one doesn't have its own code points. It's always expressed in the two code points that the, the original combined with a modifier. And the third case of combination is what we call the surrogate pairs. This is mainly due to a historical reason when the Unicode standard was first proposed. They proposed Unicode to be 16 bits long, and that's when Java decided to use like UTF-16, which maps perfectly fine for those. But then uh, a few years later, they said 16 bit is not enough, we need 21 bits. And that's when the compatibility problem happens. And the solution of Unicode is that they reserve some space, some special code points, what they call like high surrogate and low surrogate. So in this case, say for example, if I want to get the emoji, the alien emoji, which is beyond the 16 bit code points, what I need to do in Java is to combine a high surrogate with a low surrogate, and then I get back the alien emoji. And all these different kind of combinations leads to a problem with counting. For example, if I'm trying to call the dot length method on the alien emoji, I will get back two because if you call the dot length method, it's counting the number of code units, which in Java is 16 bits. So since this alien emoji is formed by the high surrogate and low surrogate, I'm getting like two 16 bit code units. And this can be seen in some applications like Twitter. In this case, you can see on the left, I have 15 characters left, but if I type in the emoji, it becomes 13. So even Twitter is not handling it perfectly. But if you're trying to write an application where you really need to handle it perfectly, say for example, if you are trying to write uh, WhatsApp and you want to impose a limit on the group name and you expect people to put emoji in the group name, then you may want to handle it properly using Java's brick iterator. In this case, you can see high alien. If I use brick iterator to do the counting, I'm able to get three, which is closer to what uh, the user perceived character counts to be. And this is also called graph theme uh, in Unicode terminology. And moving next, um, using char in Java for Unicode is very, very dangerous because char is limited to 16 bit in Java. That's why if you, in this example, if you're trying to iterate a string by printing out the underlying char, you won't get a meaningful printout for the emoji because the emoji is formed by two individual surrogate and printing out the surrogate doesn't give you any meaningful printout. And instead, you should try to use code points on the string method to iterate the string and then uh, print the underlying array based on the code points. And regex is another very dangerous area when you are dealing with Unicode. For example, this is a very common pattern that people use to extract a, a word uh, with a certain pattern and using the slash W pattern. And in this case, you can see if someone names it Zoe with E with an acute accent, then you will be losing the last character. To prevent this, uh, starting from Java 7, you have to specify this Unicode character class, which will allow you to handle this placeholder properly. And finally, databases is very, very tricky because each database handles Unicode differently. For example, some database may require you to declare the column as n var char instead of just char. And some databases require you to set on the database level what kind of locale you want to use and you have to choose very, very carefully. And my advice for this is to basically read the manual very carefully for the database that you, you are using. And if we take MySQL as an example, um, if you 
just try to use the UTF-8 encoder. Actually, default to UTF-8 MP3, which if you go to the menu, it says it supports Unicode character up to three bytes. And Unicode character up to three bytes will not be enough to support some of the newer emojis. And imagine if you are building an application like WhatsApp and you are trying to use MySQL as the backend storage and someone creates a, a group name with an emoji and that will get lost in your database if you are using the default UTF-8 encoding. So again, please read the manual very carefully uh, if you are trying to set up a database to be Unicode aware. So that's pretty much the end of my talk. Um, I hope that by now you will get a basic standing, understanding of how Unicode works. And the next time when you see something like this, instead of doing the Home Alone Kit, I hope you will become Master Yoda where you're very, very calm and you know exactly why it's happening and you know what to look for to solve the problem. And here are some useful references that I used in the talk. And thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Very much appreciated. Um, I'm going to leave it there for a few seconds for um, feedback, uh, feedback for questions, Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for Jeremy? That either um, unmute your microphone if you wanted to ask outright or, um, uh, or put them in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, I've got a question, Barry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Cesar. Um, I just I missed something. So you said the ASCII was eight, eight bytes, right? And that was not enough. Uh, for, but and then you said UTF-8 is using is also using so eight, eight bits, and then you said UTF-8 is also using eight bits. So but UTF-8 has more character than ASCII, so maybe I missed the. Okay, uh, let me cover this again. So all these UTF-8, 16, 32, The number here is talking about the unit of measurement for that encoding scheme. Okay. So you can see here UTF-8 using eight bit. So each unit here is eight bit, but each character can um, use up to four bytes. So here is eight, 16, 24, okay. 32. Okay. So it's both UTF-8 and UTF-16 are variable encoding scheme. So it can use up to four bytes per character. Okay, okay. So what are the advantages of using bigger unit and then to have a smaller number of, of units? Like what's the advantages of UTF-16 over UTF-8? Okay, um, one advantage oh, because, of, yeah. yeah, one advantage of UTF-16 is that for some of the characters, it actually uses less memory. So you can see for this Chinese character in UTF-16 is only using uh, two bytes. But then in UTF-8, is using actually using three bytes. So if you are storing a document with a lot of Chinese, then UTF-16 is actually more space efficient. I don't really see an advantage for UTF-32, except that it's fixed size. So that's the only scheme where each, each character will be four bytes, no matter which language it is in. But UTF-8 and UTF-16 both have some advantages. That answer your question, Cesar? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Perfect. Um, I think we just, just had another one through. Would it be more convenient to handle Unicode characters in Python as compared to Java? Um, it's actually pretty similar. In, in Python, if you are using Python 3, they have changed a lot in terms of the Unicode handling. In Python 2, a Unicode string is different from a normal string, but in Python 3, everything is defaulted to Unicode. So if you're using Python 3, it's actually pretty similar to Java. But in terms of the pitfalls, like uh, whether you can match Unicode characters with regex, that I'm not entirely sure. You probably need to go back to the menu to check if Python uh, supports those kind of, say, Unicode, uh, brick iterator, et cetera. Okay, great. Um, another question as well. Is there any other libraries to handle determining the encoding uh, like UTF-8, UTF-16 and UTF-32? Um, 
for so in in UTF sixteen they have something called the byte order mark that is at the beginning of the file. So if you have a file that contains the byte order mark, then you can tell for sure that this is probably a UTF sixteen file. UTF eight by default doesn't use a byte order mark, but in Java if you use the ICU library uh, that is in one of these link, the ICU library contains some convenient uh, function calls that can help you with guessing what the encoding the file is in with some heuristics. But I haven't used it myself, so it you can look and look at the documentation. But this is probably the most advanced library in Java for dealing with Unicode. Okay, just a few more questions then, um, and we're going to go to Imogen at uh, 7.30. Um, there's a question there, Jeremy. I think it's probably easier for you to read that than it is for me to try and um, uh, read all the, um, the numbers and, and letters, uh, if you don't mind, from uh, Kletos. Um, my sequels, uh, UTF-8. Okay, uh, let me open that the chat. So my SQL UTF-8 MD4 can use up to four bytes per code point and four UTF-8 bytes are enough to encode any UTF character. So is my SQL UTF-8? Yes, the answer is yes. And indeed, uh, in the my SQL documentation, there is a disclaimer uh, below that, that in the next version of my SQL, they will actually default UTF-8 to use the latest one. but as of now, the latest version isn't using the uh, latest one, the MB4 format. Okay, and final question from, and forgive me if I get the uh, pronunciation wrong here, but Rishikesh, um, how do we handle Unicode in C slash CPP? Uh, and what about uh, the problem of displaying the Unicode characters on console? Let's see first. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't answer the question in C and CPP. I haven't worked with it at all. Um, but in terms of the console question, um, it, it entirely depends on which console you use. Say, for example, on Windows, if you use the old command prompt, it doesn't have very good Unicode support until the latest Windows update. I think it's the anniversary update. But if you use PowerShell, it has native Unicode support, and Unix as well, the terminal has native Unicode support. So I hope that answers half of your question. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Jeremy, really appreciate that. Um, we will uh, pop up a, um, a feedback link on here in a second. If everyone could, um, could get feedback through, that would be wonderful. Um, and now I'm going to um, hand over to uh, Imogen. So uh, Imogen's talk is web security when building web applications. Um, so Imogen Lukoye is a full stack developer, student and mentor based in Nairobi. Uh, she's passionate about building applications from the idea stage to the apps development stage. So Imogen, whenever you're ready. Yeah, so everyone, uh, I hope you can all hear me nice and clearly. Um, so, so I'm going to be giving a talk about uh, in web apps with state in mind. And I'd like to start off with uh, some statistics and ask you a question. Did you know? Uh, did you know that in October 2013, uh, Adobe was hacked and nearly uh, 150 million usernames and hash password pairs were stolen from Adobe by hackers. And as a result, Adobe had to pay uh, $1.1 million in legal fees for violating Customer Records Act. And um, in September of 2018, uh, 50 million users' access tokens were stolen by hackers in Facebook. And these hackers were able to directly access users' private information without requiring their original passwords 
and without um, the validating two-factor authentication. We also have Canva, which was hacked in May 2019, where 137 million users' accounts were exposed. That means that their emails, usernames, uh, and cities were uh, exposed to hackers, and the hackers also claim to gain OAuth login tokens for users who had used Google to sign in. And the latest uh, hacking incident was with Twitter this year in July, where 130 high-profile accounts were hacked uh, to promote a Bitcoin scam. And these hackers use something called social engineering, where you successfully manipulate a small group of people. And in this case, a small group of uh, Twitter employees were manipulated and their credentials were used to gain access to, to Twitter internal systems. And these hackers were able to bypass the two-factor authentication. So what does this statistic tell us? Um, it tells us that we as developers need to be aware we need to be aware that our systems might not be safe as we are developing them. So we need to be cautious of the security vulnerabilities that might exist in our applications. It also tells us that there are types of hackers. We know that there are black hats who hack sites with malicious intent. We also know that there are the gray hats who poke around sites and they, they, they look to see if your site has any vulnerability, but the difference with them is that they have normal intentions. The only purpose is to like, they, it's like they get thrilled out of that, but they report to you uh, your site's vulnerabilities. We also get to understand that we are at risk. Many of us here have applications online. We have social media accounts and we use our emails and our, pass our passwords. We also pay for things online. So we as developers, we consume other developers' applications and we are not, our, at, we, we are not uh, secure as users and as developers. So everyone is at risk. So with this in mind, we need to equip ourselves as developers, we need to educate ourselves, and we need to know which kind of vulnerabilities exist in our application so that we can deal with them effectively, or we can try and mitigate the risks of um, these attacks. So this is what our talk is about today. I'm going to walk you through two types of web attacks that we can encounter. The first one is cross-site scripting, and the second one is third party asset security. So cross-site scripting is also known as XSS and it's a, time, it's a type of uh, injection attack. It's ranked number seven on the Open Web App Security Project list of top 10 web application security risks. And um, this kind of injection attack causes a piece of code to be injected into your application which can read data, the attacker can read data, or make your user perform certain operations. And danger zones where we can get these attacks are mostly in JavaScript functions, like for example, in the alert function. If an attacker can input their own code in your alert function, then the user, it pops up on the user screen and the user can be asked to perform a certain operation, which can be dangerous. Then you have the HTML elements, especially in HTML. So for example, if you set the inner HTML to empty quotation marks, that the, whatever will be rendered to the user will be an empty page. That means a whole website will, will have disappeared by just injecting that piece of code. We also have the script elements, um, which are nested in between our HTML elements. And what makes this so dangerous is the fact that we cannot easily detect them because we, could, we, can, we can easily think that this is a piece of our code. So it's really hard to be suspicious of this. Then we have anything that you render back to the user. For example, if the user inputs a certain data and you want to like verify to them that it, it was successful, then you can use flash messages or validation messages. And it's easy for someone to inject malicious code onto that. We also have malicious attachments, for example, uploads from the user. It's so easy to change the extension of an image file from a PNG to a HTML. These image files contain uh, data like uh, shutter speed, data like geolocation. So an attacker can easily change the file extension to HTML, 
inject malicious code and upload it to your website without you knowing about it. So these are the various ways in which we can protect ourselves from this kind of attack. The first thing is don't put user data directly into the following places. If you're using a script tags, if you're using HTML comments, and if you're using uh, style blocks, um, it is not uh, advisable to directly put user data in there. We also need to escape user data. What does this mean? This means that um, if your application is receiving data from out, from an outside source, then we need to inspect that data to make sure that it's not malicious. Escaping user data disallows certain characters from being used in your application. So if a user is trying to input, to fill a form with an input age and the code starts with angle brackets, we automatically know that that is code. So we can easily escape it and mitigate the risk of having security breaches in our applications. We also can validate the user input, and this means to check whether the user input is safe and correct to use in your application. Um, for example, if a user is submitting, a, we must make sure that the link submitted follows the HTTP or HTTPS protocol, meaning that it is safe. We can also check the values that have been inputted. If you're expecting an integer, make sure that the user is inputting an integer and not a string as an input to your application. And these are some, these are, these are the ways that we can protect ourselves. These are some of the ways that we can use to protect ourselves from cross-site scripting attacks. Uh, about the malicious attachments, you can restrict the file up, upload types that your user can upload. And you can, it is best practice to research thoroughly on the type of attachment and their capabilities. For example, if your, your, your application is taking in a PDF attachment, then it's good for you as a developer to search online about the capabilities of a PDF file, how safe is it, and it be easily hacked and stuff like that before you allow uploads into your application. You can also use uh, the content security policies. This is uh, a framework that uses, um, that gives you uh, guidelines on how to ensure your web app is secure. Um, CPS directives are used in the HTTP header of your application. For example, we have the script source directive. This is how you put it in your header, like content security policy followed by script source, then you insert the, the, the source of the script. And this ensures that you have valid JavaScript source. You have one for the image and one for the media. So for the image, it verifies that the source of the image and the favicon are valid. And the media one verifies that the media resource used, that is audio and video, are valid. Uh, the next kind of attack that we can experience are the um, third-party asset security attacks. So as developers, many of us, we use third-party assets and we inject them directly into our, our application using the script tags. But why do we use third-party assets? We use them because they provide a cheap and fast way to scale our businesses and technologies. But as we use them, do we really know what what they do to our application. Do we really take time to think about that? Well, we may think that we are using them for a certain functionality in our application, but what they can really pose a great security threat because they can modify our websites without our permission. And attackers favor this kind of um, third party asset attack because a third party is, is remote. So even if you mod modify it, it's undetectable you cannot know if it has a malicious script or not. Uh, an example of this is the is Pipka. Pipka, uh, I think, came about in 2019, where it was used to read information from e-commerce sites and um, online credit sites. So Pipka is a JavaScript malicious script that reads your database. And what's unique about Pipka is the fact that after it, it reads your data, it has the ability to remove itself without being detected. So it's barely detectable. Um, Pipka preys on the weaknesses of externally installed scripts in order to steal sensitive data. Also, we have the 
MedCart group of hackers, and this group of hackers uh, perform a certain type of attack called supply chain attack, which exploits third party applications. So this is also used to steal sensitive information from unsuspecting users, and it was mostly famous uh, in e-commerce sites. So um, to, de to defend our ourselves against third party asset security, then we have to use a YAN lock or any type of lock file. A lock file will ask you anytime you want to upgrade, it will always pose the question, I, do you really want to upgrade? So it's, it's your choice to answer yes or no. So this will let you know that you are installing a new version and you'll be aware that it can pose a security threat. Next thing we can do is to use the long-term support version for third-party assets and vendors. This is because um, long-term support contains mature code with patched issues. So there's no need to upgrade to a newer like version if the old version still works because you'd be risking your application. Next we can, um, when you're using open source projects, we should work with open source projects that um, work with bug bounty support. And this means that these open source projects really care about the security issues because Bug bounty projects uh, support uh, gray hackers who find, find vulnerabilities in your site and they um, report it to the site. So you can be sure that the apps you're using are really secure. Um, next, we can use the uh, sub resource integrity attributes um, when using third party assets, especially when we are importing third party assets that require a CDN. Uh, SRI or uh, sub resource integrity is a security feature which verifies that resources imported into an application don't contain manipulated script. Um, SRI provides a 64, uh, base 64 encode, encoded uh, cryptographic hash that starts off with the SHA-256 or SHA-384 or SHA-512 prefix. And this is placed inside your, your tags. So it uses a keyword called integrity before placing the prefix and the cryptographic hash. And what this does, it, it allows um, a resource to be loaded only if it matches the cryptographic hash. It also refuses to load any third party asset if its contents have changed from the previous load. So as an example, normally in your header, as you're developing your applications, you'd, in, you'd um, embed your script like this. So this script is a jQuery CDN script with no protection, which means it's vulnerable to attack. But if you add the SRI attributes, then this is the integrity keyword, which comes, um, this is the integrity keyword, which comes first then you have the SHA key, then this is the cryptographic hash, which is used to match the source and make sure that it's safe and it, has, it doesn't have any malicious script. So in closing, what we need to understand is that JavaScript is a beautiful language for web development, but it's also dangerous if used for, for mal intentions because it directly manipulates the DOM. So if a, if a hacker decides to manipulate the DOM uh, with malintent, then that means our applications are not safe. Another thing you need to know is that data doesn't, uh, is that data that doesn't originate from your application, you should always treat it as, as suspicious and sanitize it. Sanitize it means check that it is secure before injecting it into your application. And you need for the best place for security for using the sub resource integrity attributes and using the content security policy attributes when you're coding. So, a famous quote for this session is Every program has at least two purposes one for which it was written, and the other for which wasn't. it wasn't. So, with that in mind, then I wish everyone to develop their next application with security in mind. That would be the end of the talk. Thank you, Imogen. Uh, Barry is away. He had to leave, so I'm going to be subbing for him just to close him. Thank you for your talk. Do we have any, any questions? 
for Imogen. You can unmute yourself or you can write them in the chat. Well, maybe while people write some questions, I've got one for you. Did you, when did you get, when did you start getting interested in security? Is it something that you, that you always had in mind or is it something that you kind of learned the hard way throughout your career and you decided that it was important to look at? Uh, I became interested in security after doing a course on front-end masters. That's when I really started to understand like some of the pieces of code that I've been using in developing my applications. So that's where my interest began. Okay. So there's a question. Ah, so one is saying this good performance, but it reflects on JavaScript. Would you mind doing one for other languages? So I guess it's ideas for the future, maybe. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. Or maybe they can say like which language they had in mind. Uh, yeah, Grace. Python. Oh, Python. Oh, okay. Yeah, so maybe more of a backend perspective. Uh, but then. if you can take a close. Uh, okay, uh, the talk I was giving was mainly about the front end. If you notice, mm -hmm. because cross site scripting is actually performed from the front end side, from the user side, and the third party assets are also added to the front end resources. So that's why. Yeah. yeah, their documentation is actually nice, the OWASP, which I encourage everyone to take a look at. Also, Mo Mozilla has some nice, um, the SRI are from Mozilla. So they have nice guidelines for the HTTP header, where you can put the content security policy for your sites and the cause to ensure that it's safe. Yeah. Probably I would say that I'm, I'm not definitely not an expert on security, but I've definitely have this feeling that one common point between front end and back end in terms of security is to do with uh, library versions. That if you're not, if you're running an old uh, versions or if you're changing a version and the version has been hacked, like you said, there's always basically dependencies is a big exposure. Yeah, like web security is really an issue. We cannot like, um bring it to zero, but at least we can try mitigate the risk and be careful while we're developing so that we don't get hacked and our users' data remains safe. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes even being careful, if you're not aware of the different ways that there are, you know, even if you're, so that's why sometimes it's a bit of a, it can be hard, but in big companies, there are some dedicated team. Although I don't know if this is always a solution to have yeah. one team focusing on something and the other team. Yeah. Mm, you can see like from the talk I gave, like big companies like Canva, Adobe were yeah, being hacked. And <laughs> the latest one is Twitter. And this guy's like, yeah, yeah. So you can never be like too careful, yeah. but we can always try, which is better than doing nothing, I yeah. think, yeah. Do we have any more questions? Okay, so I think that's probably it for tonight. Um, well, thank you to the two speakers. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, yeah, everyone have a good evening if you're in the same time zone or <laughs> good day if you're in different time zones. All right, goodbye everyone. I'm going to end the meeting okay. now. Don't rem uh, sorry. Uh, remember to fill the feedback. It's very important for speakers because uh, th these these events, I guess, are used to expand and improve. And constructive feedback is is very important. So yeah, I think uh, Barry put the link in the chat and also by email. So uh, excuse me, I have a question. Oh yes, of course. Um, how are we gonna get the slides from both the talks? That's a good question. 
I don't know. I, I, I would send it to Barry. I think he could probably include it in maybe his LinkedIn post later when he posts the recording. Okay, and you imagine you will share the, the link to your to your slides later as well? Okay, well, yeah, so don't forget to send the feedback and uh, yeah, have a good evening everyone. I'm going to end the meeting now. Bye-bye. Okay.